Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called to his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Some people have long loved the story of that woman and her two copper coins. Whenever a church or some other Christian organization is raising funds, she is brought out as the paragon of generosity. She is the reminder that it doesn't matter how much money an individual has, their sacrificial giving can make a difference. It is a beautiful sentiment, though I can also see how it could sometimes be used to cynically manipulate some people into giving more than they can afford. But there is something that has long bothered me about that story. What Jesus says about the widow is generally taken one way, but the same words spoken with a somewhat different tone and inflection, could carry quite a different message. And there is one other thing about it. The story takes place at the end of the twelfth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, which means that people tend to stop reading or pause at the end of it and assume that the following verse is the start of a new section. But the gospel was not written with chapters and verses. In fact, the ancient manuscripts don't even have as much as spaces between the words. Such things were only added centuries later. So, what if the author of this gospel didn't mean for us? to stop reading after Jesus' comment about the widow. Why would any of that make a difference? Well, what if I were to tell you the story this way? This is Retelling the Bible. Episode 6.24 Tiny Coins and Massive Stones She made her way through the festival crowd with a look of determination on her face. She would have once been considered a beautiful woman, but you could tell that she had been worn down by grief and loss. She looked old before her time. She was dressed in the manner of a widow, and her clothing was well-worn and patched. She had the look of sadness about her. But she was making her way towards the treasury of the temple, as if she was on a great mission. The people always thronged about the treasury during the festivals 
such as Pentecost. It was one of the more popular attractions within the temple complex. Every Jewish male was required to come and make a contribution at least once a year, and most of those who came from any distance chose to do so at a time such as this. All through the long years of their marriage, her husband had brought her down to Jerusalem for the festivals, and together they had gone to the treasury and made the required offering. An official of the temple always stood nearby, ready to check and make sure that every family did their part. The money was used to pay for the regular sacrifices and the general upkeep of the temple. But for a long time now, the most visible way that these contributions were used had been to pay for the lavish rebuilding effort that had been underway now for nearly half a century. King Herod had begun the program, and it still continued now, almost forty decades after his death. Many called it Herod's Temple, though the more popular name up in Galilee was Herod's folly. Many saw it as a vanity project, as well as something the king had undertaken to ingratiate himself with the Jerusalem elite. Like many of Herod's other constructions, the renewed temple was massive in scale, with huge stone blocks fitted together in a way that was designed to impress. But it had the opposite effect on some. Certainly many up in Galilee resented how much money it took away from the Galilean economy for the benefit of those in Jerusalem. But still, they paid, because there really was no choice. As she approached the treasury, the widow certainly felt as if she had no choice but to contribute, though technically she did. It was actually only Jewish men who were required to contribute. A widow was generally considered to be exempt, but she had lived her life with a man who had taken such obligations very seriously. Even when money was tight, even when, uh, the previous year, his health had made the journey to Jerusalem so difficult, he had insisted on going and making the gift. For what would his friends do? What would his neighbors think if he failed to do so? And so, when the Passover came around this year, even though he was gone, she hadn't even thought about it. She had just scraped together what few coins she had left and headed out with the other people from her village. She could feel the two small coins in her sweaty palm as she approached the trumpets. The treasury consisted of a set of strong wooden boxes reinforced with metal. They were chained down and under constant guard, of course. And in order to permit people to make their contributions, each box had been fitted with a long metal tube that was flared at one end. People called them trumpets because of the way they resembled the horns of beasts that were sounded at important festivals. 
That was also why people sometimes referred to the contributions that people made as sounding the trumpets. When someone dumped a large purse full of coins into a tube, it would make a huge clatter as they fell. And the people who were nearby would all look up and take note of the wealthy men who made such donations that went well above what was required. It was a fantastic way to increase your honor and standing in society. But, of course, when someone like this widow came along with only two small coins, no one even noticed the tiny little clink they made as she put them in. She hadn't expected anyone to notice. But still, she felt as if she had done her duty. And she even whispered to her dead husband under her breath as she moved away from the boxes. There, Matthias, that was for you. She honestly didn't even know what she was going to do now. And she almost didn't care. The little knot of Galileans had been sitting across from the treasury all morning. And they, like everyone else, had been watching and commenting on the spectacle of people coming and going from the treasury. And most of them had been only too happy to mark the biggest contributors, making a game of estimating how much each one had put into the tubes. But one of them, who sat at the center of the group, did not seem to be quite as amused by the show. In fact, he was becoming rather annoyed. Finally, he erupted, as was his habit, with a lesson that he wanted to share with his companions. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them, he said, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do, so they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. His friends, as was their habit, solemnly nodded at what he had said. He was constantly saying such things, so much so that they had all taken to calling him teacher. But this lesson soon went out of their heads as they returned to their game. And so it was that when the widow passed by and dropped in her contribution, one of the Galileans listened to the tiny noise made by her two coins and chimed in with his guess. That had to be two leptons, he said, referring to the small copper coins that were the smallest pieces in circulation. Some of the others sniggered at the small size of such a gift. That was about enough for the teacher. He jumped angrily to his feet and rebuked not only them, but all those who were within the sound of his voice. Do you want to know the truth? This poor widow that you are laughing at has put in more than all these others who are contributing to the treasury. They have enough and more to spare, and out of that they have contributed. But this woman, in her poverty, has put in everything she had. 
That's right. This temple has just sucked all she had to live on out of her. And with that, he turned on his heel and left the temple. He walked away with such a look of disgust on his face that it was plain to everyone that he was done with the entire institution. It seemed that he would never be back. His friends all looked at each other with shock. Despite all of its troubles and the scandals of its priesthood, it was simply unthinkable that a good Jew could turn his back on the temple. They scrambled to their feet and quickly went after him. They caught up to him just after he passed through the gate. He was still fuming and walking at a mad pace, so they were practically running to catch him. But they called out to him as he stormed on. Teacher, they cried, and they tried desperately to think of some reason why he should not completely abandon the temple and all that it stood for. Teacher, they finally said, thinking of something. Did you, uh, did you see how impressive the temple looks? Did you see how massive the stones are? That's really something, isn't it? He stopped and turned to them. Stones? Stones? That's what you got to say to me? Are you trying to suggest that it's okay that they rob widows of all they have to live on just so long as the stones are large and impressive? Well, let me tell you something about these stones. It won't matter how big any of them are when not one of them is left upon the other. I find it amazing to see how the story of the widow and her donation, often referred to as the story of the widow's might, gets pulled out and celebrate. And I certainly agree with the main point that people often take from the story. We do often make way too much of wealthy donors and their gifts because even when they give only a tiny portion of their wealth, the gift can be so large that it has an enormous impact. Meanwhile, those who only have limited means can give a much larger portion of what they have, but nobody notices because the actual dollar figure is so small. It is a very unjust way of dealing with the generosity of givers. And yet it happens all the time. And there is no doubt in my mind that Jesus was outraged by the basic injustice of that reaction. But my question is, how did he react? Did he simply admire the widow for her generosity? Or was he angry? at how the institution of the temple was exploiting poor people like her. I maintain that the words alone, as transmitted to us in the Gospel of Mark, do not give us the answer to that question. What's more, almost everything that Jesus said about the temple, apart, apparently, from this saying, suggests that he was not really a fan. 
he physically attacked the changing of money and the selling of sacrificial animals, which was essential to the functioning of the place. He even threatened to tear the buildings down himself, which, of course, the Gospel of John reassures us, was merely a metaphorical threat. I also think that the arbitrary chapter break after Jesus' saying about the widow hasn't served us well. Well, it is possible that the disciples idly struck up a conversation about how big and impressive the stones were as he walked out of the temple. It does make a bit more sense if he was storming out and they were trying desperately to find some reason for why the temple shouldn't be rejected. But it is really just a question of tone and inflection, something that, unfortunately, the written word does not convey very well. We are left to decide for ourselves. That is it for this episode of Retelling the Bible. Please subscribe so you can get the next episode in a couple of weeks. And please leave a review on your podcast provider to help other people find and appreciate this podcast. The theme music for the podcast is Ah Da by Kevin MacLeod. And the mood music for this episode is Infinity by Sasha End. It is licensed under the Creative Commons and can be found at filmmusic.io. You can contact me on Twitter at Retelling Bible, on the Facebook page, Retelling the Bible. Show notes for this episode have been posted at retellingthebible.wordpress.com. Thanks again to my Patreon supporters who back this podcast. If you'd like to join them and discover the benefits they receive, go to patreon.com slash retelling the Bible. This is Retelling the Bible, and I have been your storyteller, W. Scott McCandless. <laughs>